like five years from now, every seller in every software company will know how to win with cloud. Like, and today we're probably still in that like five to 10%. And some companies that are very cloud forward will have a much higher percentage. The biggest thing I see people mess up is they think like initiating this cloud go-to-market channel is an experiment and it's not a long-term strategic revenue play. As cloud go-to-market's gone more mainstream, we're seeing less of this, but still like there's a lot of confusion as to what it is, how it fits in, what success looks like. And it's a new way of selling. You have to invest in it like it's a new channel and that does require this longer term horizon. Join our five-week course on cloud marketplaces and learn how to tap into the $250 billion spend that enterprises have committed to AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud. Discover the future of go-to-market with Roman. During weekly sessions, you'll learn how to leverage this fast-growing channel and network with industry experts and partnership leaders. We'll dive into marketplace strategies, internal buy-in, building relationships with the cloud, and mastering co-sell. Join our upcoming cohort in September. Use link in comments for early bird pricing. John, great to have you today. I'm really excited to have our conversation about cloud go to market. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. You built this amazing company called Takalo.io, and Takalo had pretty strong conviction in cloud marketplaces before this entire momentum started, right? Now, all of a sudden, we are just living in the, in the wave of clouds, hyperscalers, doubling down on the marketplaces, and you've been like a leader in the space. I would love to hear a little bit more about your story to give us a, a, our audience a sense. What was your initial insight and how cloud go to market evolved over the last couple of years? Yeah, it was, I mean, it's funny back in 2015, uh, Dylan Woods, co-founder, CTO was thinking about building a company and was experiment, knew it wanted, wanted to be in cloud and was experimenting with services. And, you know, he was part of the SaaS beta program for AWS marketplace and, and, he spent some time experimenting there and was like, hey, I think the clouds are going to change the way that software is sold. I think marketplaces represent the initiation point of that. And I think this is too hard for most software companies. Like no one wants to build software to sell software. And we we raised a small seed round to experiment on that simple concept. And pretty quickly, we were able to get to our first customer who was New Relic, who was like, yes, we totally agree. We think this is a new distribution channel for us. We've struggled to figure out how to take advantage of it. Can you help us? And you know, really started that journey in mid 2017 and have grown ever since then. And like it's like cloud go to market is a sneaky, complicated problem where it, you think about, oh, getting listed with AWS, how hard could that be? But like getting listed is the starting line, not the finish line. Building a scalable revenue system inside of your company is the destination. And that requires not just thinking about one build. It oftentimes requires thinking about one cloud, thinking about how do you integrate that with your company's operations? How do you teach your sellers to take advantage of these new tools? How do you do that across clouds, which is where a lot of our customers want to go? And the complexity of the problem even now, as we layer co-sell in and think about using data to make decisions about cloud go-to-market, it just continues to get more complicated. I probably need to like mention that uh, cloud go-to-market is basically when you list your products on one of the major hyperscalers, right? And, and, and then after that, you work together with them to, 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 to sell. And uh, I look forward to, to dig deeper into intricacies of that. Um, but you also like... On top of running a widely successful company, you've been doing this research on state of cloud marketplaces, which is now on third year called state of cloud go to market. I'm curious, like what have been the most uh, counterintuitive sort of finding maybe? When we started, I mean, when we started the report, the an there was very little analyst coverage around marketplace as a segment of cloud. And there was some interest, like uh, Jay McBain was a very early person to this, but we, he had just started to talk about it and write about it. And we're like, we want to go out and do research on behalf of the ISV ecosystem, on behalf of partners, just to help people understand what was happening. And in our very first year, the initial finding that like we had the hypothesis around, but this research validated was the cloud, the power of the cloud budgets and how they were durable, they were multi-year in nature. And that was the thing everybody was excited about at that point in time. And I think people continue to be excited about cloud budget and being able to 
like make it easier to sell faster or sell bigger using the cloud budget. It's do you want to buy from me and your cloud bill is a pretty easy question to get answered these days. Uh, that was the first insight in like year one. The second centered around velocity and deal velocity. And this was uh, especially as we started in, in 2020, there still were a lot of people who were just kicking off their cloud go to markets. They, they thought it was they had a hypothesis around it. They'd see some initial success from early adopters. But a lot of people had not gotten to scale. But those who had gotten to scale started to acknowledge this point that they could sell faster using this as a channel, using a standard contract from the cloud providers, again, using budget, making an offer really easy to accept instead of going through the standard negotiation process that a direct seller has to do. So the second insight really centered around selling faster. Um, which is one that I continue to love, like especially as we transition out of the era of growth at all costs to this capital efficient growth era, deal velocity is like when deals take 18 months, it costs a lot from a selling standpoint, not a lot, let alone from a buying standpoint. So second was velocity. The third, and this one really, the, the next two were out of the last year's report. And the third one centered around the percentage of revenue ISVs were targeting cloud go to market for. And in the first few years, we, we would see like early sellers be like, hey, I want to go do a handful of deals in my first year. I want to go prove the pattern. And then I want to go from a handful of deals to like tens of deals. But it wasn't described in like percentage of revenue. And in 2022, we actually reframed the question to be like, what percentage of revenue do you think you would target through the clouds? And 44% of sellers said they were targeting 10% of their revenue through a cloud go to market channel. And when I first saw it, I'm like, is 10% a lot? Like I, I actually, I didn't think it was at first. And then when you unpack it, you're like 10% for a billion dollar ISV is a hundred million dollars flowing through one channel. That's probably the biggest channel in the company. Uh, and it, like, I got really excited about this evolution of cloud go to market as the largest potential channel for these companies. So that was one. And then the other insight from that year centered around channel, like AWS had done some work to unlock channel plus marketplace via a program called CPPO, which was really exciting. And it took a little while to get rolling. But really in 2022, there was pretty broad sentiment from the ISV ecosystem that marketplace plus channel was something they would use and use much, much more. And we've seen that play out in the data this year. I think uh, you absolutely right. People are still very excited about cloud commits and they don't really understand like how, how much the scale really the long term contracts locked into specific cloud words, right? I published like a few research uh, for the recent. I loved your stats on that, by the way. Those were some really great stats. Thanks so much. Uh, so it's like more than 200 billion across like all of these three, three hyperscalers. And I think it's, it's really compelling. So people sh should take notice. But I'm, I'm curious, like, what are the things that uh, make these three hyperscalers like so invested in this in this kind of marketplace motion? Why 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 is this sort of they unanimously vote that this is the future? I think there's a few key reasons, and and like marketplace is a multi persona problem where you have the platform provider, so the clouds, and why is it good for the clouds? Then you have the buyers, like why does this make sense for a buyer? Then you have the seller, why does it make sense for a seller? You could even layer channel in as a persona there. And the problem that the hyperscalers have had to solve is the incentive across all of that. And like why, the why is it good for everyone? And I think they've all done a really good job of this over the last three years. But when we just unpack it from a cloud provider standpoint, I think the first, the primary reason why was to help their customers. Like they all have hundreds of services these days, but there's that hundreds of thousands of software products and the combination of first party products, first party cloud services and third party products is what makes up the majority of digital transformation these days. So first, like initially it was about how do we give our customers the tools they need to be successful with us as providers? And I think that was really smart. The second part really started with this idea around share of wallet. So if you think back to like 2015 or how often was the cloud budget a top five or top 10 expense inside a company? 
Probably not that often. Maybe for some born cloud native companies, it was there, but it wasn't broadly. Where today, cloud is oftentimes in that top 10 expense inside a company as people eliminate data centers, build new workloads, new applications. And for them to be able to capture a larger share of the wallet, marketplace enables that and aligning third party purchases and first party consumption together enables them to capture a larger uh, larger share of the budget. And I think that truly benefits the cloud providers. It also benefits the buyers, especially in this economic cycle, because they're looking for ways to hedge these commitments. They made multi-year, like three to five year commitments to the clouds. And right now, everybody's going through like, how do I optimize their plans a year ago might not be what their plans are today. And third party purchasing actually gives them a hedge where they're like, well, maybe I'm not going to use as much of this core service as I do but I could actually consolidate some contract purchasing under the umbrella of cloud. So it's a benefit for both the cloud and the buyer. And then, I mean, they're not in this for, for fun. It's all about driving core service consumption. Like it's, uh, and like when you can tell your story as an ISV about, I help your buyer do the following. I help you drive core service consumption. Everybody wins. So uh, and and this gets a bit like this is probably a less talked about part. I think there's this entanglement of like first party workloads, third party software bound together into next generation applications. It's like containerization has made workloads a lot easier to move around. But when you entangle first and third party services together in a really complicated way, the likelihood of those services moving around goes down, uh, at least from my standpoint. That's I I don't. That's not a benefit the clouds ever talk about. It's one I personally think is like a downstream effect of integrating marketplace and core service consumption together. You're absolutely right. And uh, I've seen light uh, from, I think, Cloudflare in the deck about, specifically about that. As soon as you sort of build on top of the cloud and customers start to use it and they integrate other products into the cloud, then retention just go up, right? And then the you know switch is... Very difficult to make, really. Um, and to your previous point about 10%, if you think about um, how much partnership as a function typically drives revenue, I think it, it sort of drives, depending on the company, between 10 to like 30%. For some companies, it drives like, you know, more than 50, especially cybersecurity, many of them of your clients. So if you, if you, if you, if you drive like 10%, and more through cloud marketplaces, it's like half or third maybe of the entire partnership function, right? And it's it's it's, it's destined to grow. Uh, so that that's why it's, it's it's really exciting. I would love to ask you, like, when 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 a person who is not like super deep into this cloud marketplaces, kind of think about it, and they 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 look at it like Google Clouds, Microsoft, and GCP, they feel that they are sort of different in, to some extent, that they sort of similar. Uh, like, what are the similarities and like, what are the ways do you think they are going towards the same direction or like, where are they sort of uh, unique? I think in general, they're all swimming towards the same destination, which is how do I, it's almost those benefits we talked through. I think they're all working towards those same things. And they've all approached it in slightly different ways. Like you rewind, AWS had a first mover advantage. They made some really smart and innovative solutions around the creation of this concept of a private offer, where a private offer is the ability to pass custom pricing in terms to a buyer using the infrastructure of marketplace. So instead of someone saying, I'm going to buy an EC2 or I'm going to buy a machine image of my product and use it for an hour, they were like, no, I'm going to do an annual contract. And those annual contracts unlocked big deals. Like this was a big innovation when it came out. Like not all, and then combining that with the alignment of the cloud budget with marketplace was a really smart thing. They were first around that. They were first to be able to bring channel and marketplace together via uh, channel partner private offer, which is the CPPO capabilities that they have. So they did some really innovative things, and they in the early days were really successful with the tech forward community will say like security, DevOps, infrastructure, storage. Uh, but over the years, they've gone both wide from a catalog standpoint and deep from a catalog standpoint. So there's a lot in there. So that's kind of like 
the lay of the land with AWS. They continue to innovate. They continue to create new business model support. Microsoft and Google both followed suit with AWS, but in slightly different ways and really from their own positions of strength. And I, when I think about Microsoft, Microsoft's a channel company, born and bred, like forever. Uh, and they had a lot of different storefronts and those storefronts did different things, but they, they converged those storefronts in like 2020. And that allowed them to bring not only their infrastructure focus with Azure, but a business focus with AppSource together into the same thing. And they, I think Microsoft really like leaned into this idea of business applications and vertical software, which maybe wasn't as prominent at that time with AWS, even though they were going wide and deep from a catalog standpoint. And then Microsoft's made some moves from a cost of marketplace standpoint over the last year that I, I think are have been pretty interesting. And, you know, they also have like this long standing success program with co-selling. Um, and, you know, for those who aren't familiar with co-selling, co-selling is the ability for your rep to partner with the cloud rep to align on how to help a buyer. And it sounds like back in the day, this was, you'd call the cloud rep and be like, hey, you want to talk about this customer? It was totally like person to person oriented. That's evolved to the point where there's technology that helps enable co-sell and it's good for everybody. It's, uh, Microsoft had this co-sell program for a long time and a lot of dollars were aligned to it and they're bringing marketplace and co-sell together. They just announced that on Spire this year, which I think is a really, really smart bit. Um, and then Google, Google has played a slightly different game that really focused on their strength and strategy from a business standpoint. It was historically less breadth and depth and much more focus from a catalog standpoint. And they focused on where they were were strong and there was a lot of strength in data with Google and the data ecosystem. And they had some really successful ISVs in their marketplace where they were focused. Uh, and you're seeing that continue with AI. And I think you'll continue to see Google. Google's defined a really successful program that is starting to go a lot of different directions. So I think like they're all playing different games, all trying to align how this fits to their strengths. Um, and and I think at the end of the day, it's so early, like $755 billion of B2B software sold, you know, single digit percentages of that flow through the cloud marketplace today. So we're, we have, there's a massive opportunity here. And if like all the analyst data is right, it's growing three times as fast as cloud. So there, there's a lot of surface area for all three of them to continue to Amazing breakdown. Thanks so much. Uh, I think you, you, you're absolutely right. There's all different companies sort of innovated in different ways. Microsoft you know, recently pushed this entire marketplace motion by dropping the commission. And also it's kind of interesting that like they, they came from different angles, but they kind of almost uh, converge in, 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 in the core, like how, how this entire marketplace motion is, is going. So you just mentioned growth of, of the cloud. And I think um, obviously last year and a half were not easy for, for tech, tech industry, but there's some silver lining emerging. Uh, so all the three uh, hyperscalers just published their earnings and uh, um, Microsoft showed like a pretty good growth of, of, of Microsoft Cloud, 20, I think 7%, AWS grew 12% on a huge base, uh, and the Google second second quarter profitable, which is great. All of them have big amounts of cloud commits and for Microsoft and uh, AWS, those commits actually grew substantially, multiple of billions of dollars. I'm curious, like, how do you think this will reflect on cloud marketplace? Everyone, has been in this cost optimization mode for the last 12 to 18 months. And I, I, I we, we work with ISVs and partners of clouds and the cloud provider. So I'm kind of a bit myopic on my focus from an industry standpoint, but every software company has been working through this. Like we went from the growth at all costs era to capital efficient growth being in favor. And those two companies are very different things. Like you designing a, 30 to 50% year over year growth company looks very different than designing a hundred percent. And that's the rationalization that's been happening over the last 12 to 18 months. And I, I don't think we'll return to maybe the chaos time of 2021. We're definitely seeing this shift from like, how do I look at the rear view mirror and figure out what we did to like, 
how do I look at the windshield and focus on where we're going? And I, I, most of the ISVs I talk to ha- have made that shift where they're looking at the second half of this year and being like, okay, we made a lot of changes. We've stabilized a lot of things. We're doubling down on focus. And now we're executing on our playbook in the second half of this year with optimism. And then next year, it'll be like, Will it be back to the races? Will it just be, you know, strong capital efficient growth? I think that's what I actually think out of this era, like this market downturn, companies that survive and thrive will be stronger, will be a vintage of companies that are so strong and well constructed, unlike anything we've seen before. So, um, and I think the other phenomenon around the economic downturn, like tech during a downturn, tech becomes an enabler. Everyone's looking, how do I do more with less? How do I get more efficient? Like you have to tech enable your company. So everyone's looking at how to use software to power their businesses in different ways. And that's where I think we can start to see this tailwind come out. So uh, I think cautiously optimistic is the way I think about things. Uh, And, you know, I I am an optimist by nature, uh, but I do think it does merit some caution. But I I do think we've seen stabilization of this like cost optimized period and a shift towards thinking about the future. I agree with you. I'm I'm very cautiously optimistic as well, and I hope that this this, this will kind of push the entire economy forward. And Jay McBain mentioned in in our last conversation that tech over and over pushed the entire economy out of recession. Uh, So hopefully this will will happen. So you just mentioned CEOs uh, who you talk with, and um, I'm sure that they ask you a lot of questions about cloud marketplaces, right? Like how do I leverage them? And like, what do I do? What is a step-by-step things? Uh, What are the sort of blind spots they they typically have uh, when when they think about it? What what are the things that's obvious to you that, that are sort of completely not obvious to them? The biggest thing I see people mess up is they think like initiating this cloud go-to-market channel is an experiment and it's not a long-term strategic revenue play. And as as cloud go-to-market's gone more mainstream, we're seeing less of this, but still like there's a lot of confusion as to what it is, how it fits in, what success looks like. And it's a new way of selling. You have to invest in it like it's a new channel and that does require this longer term horizon. So I think that's one of the first conversations that I'll have with executive teams just around how are they thinking about it from an experimentation standpoint. And it reminds me so much of the early days of cloud, like people would play around with cloud and put some basic workloads up there and be like, oh, this is great. But until they got to like, no, this is a serious thing that you can do real production work on, that was when it got real. And that's where I I think we're right now. And I try to help educate people just on what other successful ISVs look like. And a lot of times they'll be like, oh, we're just going to go the other, the other area of confusion is so like, this is for bottom top. Like we're just gonna we're gonna go get listed and people are just magically buy our product and it's gonna be they're gonna buy it in some consumption based way and everything will be amazing. When in reality, the majority of the dollars that flow through the clouds today are this larger contract private offer style using the cloud budget type deal. I do think we'll see the buyer behavior change to be more oriented over time. And we have we have very successful ISVs who do sell that way, but it's not the majority of time. So I think there's oftentimes an education around the selling motion that makes sense for cloud. Uh, so I, I try to spend some time just advising people on that and what good looks like and who's been successful and the journeys that they've gone on. Um, and then the last part's around like strategic. This is not just a go to market decision. This is a company decision. It's like a company strategy decision. How does your company and the clouds fit together? <laughs> and that's your product. That's your go to market. That's like the way you position your value to your buyer. All of those things have to be thought about, which uh, sometimes people don't think all the way through. You, you hit on a bunch of very important points. Talking about sort of the opposite of experimentation, some people read case studies and case studies typically is a great way to actually persuade and kind of see what is the effect on different companies. And uh, uh, I've been writing a bunch of case studies myself, but uh, they read all these key case studies and they're like, oh, I need to go sort of all in, in, in the clouds and kind of like hire a bunch of people and I need to re-orient, re-orient my entire like sales and marketing 
which creates like a big sort of hurdle in their minds. Like, could you talk about this type of approach? Is, is it flawed or is, is, is it sort of fair? It's a classic, like it depends answer. Uh, in general, our, our recommendation is take a step back and think about where you have the strongest value proposition. So likely, where do, where do you run your products? Where are you aligned to helping your buyers with a solution that makes sense? And if you're going to initiate cloud go to market, start there, start selling and let the tailwind of revenue drive your strategy. Like that's our typical advice. But that being said, some of our most successful customers have gone all in from day one. And they've been like, no, we know we're going to build, build the company with a third rail of cloud go to market powering our revenue system. And we want to do that across the clouds. What I've seen with companies like this is they already have experience executing on this go-to-market. So there's no like question to them about will this work and how it will work. It's really, they've seen it, they know it works, and now they want to launch from day one. It requires more investment, like your product strategy to have your products work well across all three hyperscalers and meet the demands of buyers in all three hyperscaler marketplaces is complicated. Like there's a product investment, there's a go-to-market strategy investment, there's a like infrastructure to support multi-cloud, cloud go-to-market from day one. Um, but some of these examples, like you look at Wiz, 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 they launched really early with the clouds and have been unbelievably successful. Now, is that they just have an amazing product? Yes, there's a lot of that. Like amazing product is table stakes. But like having this more all in style philosophy for them was was part of their strategy from from the beginning. And I'm, I'm really curious over, over this like next wave of companies that are trying to go through this growth phase, how they think about this. I, I think we'll see more try to replicate this, but it does require a bigger commitment. Talking about commitments and expectations, I think like typical journeys that I've seen is that companies kind of list and they start this go to market motion uh, with one of the clouds uh, and then they got like really high growth and they, 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 they then sort of double down on that and then they branch into different uh, clouds. I'm curious, like typically setting expectations, especially for management, uh, is not easy for partnership teams, right? When they sort of ask you, like, what do I tell my CEO? Or like, what do I, what do I tell to my board? Yes, we just launched with AWS. And uh, I, I read a bunch of, uh, you know, sort of earning calls, uh, for, like we, we just launched on AWS. It's, and the question that analysts will ask, like, okay, this is great. But <laughs> what do you see? And they're like, oh, we see like, kind of high growth in, in AWS, it's still small numbers. So like, let's talk about setting expectations. What is your typical advisor? It's been changing. And in some of this is a bit of the way we work is changing. So it used to be like listing is the starting line, not the finish line. And how do you align your demand with this new channel in order to meet some expectations. And, and there's typically like three waves. And the, the first wave is like, go do a handful of deals. And it's like, repeat that, get to like tens of deals where you start to get a broader population of your revenue system to understand how to take advantage of it. And then there's some definition of scale. And what scale looks like varies by company strategy. Because some people are like, scale to us is 10% of revenue. Other companies are like, scale to us is 75% of revenue. So the destination changes based upon your company strategy. And I, I, I mean, in general, we've like marketplace is the last mile. It's how you tap into the cloud budget. It's how you execute on the deals. But I think about this from a workflow standpoint, what's before execution? It's pipeline, like, okay, great. How do you create pipeline for cloud go to market? And this is where CoSell comes in. And you're like, you know, the, the co-sell, like us co-selling with the cloud providers is our pipeline that will turn into marketplace revenue over time. So how do you get good at co-selling in order to scale your revenue? Well, what's a step before co-sell? The step before co-sell is data. I have thousands potentially for large scale ISVs, sometimes hundreds of thousands of opportunities in my CRM system that I need to make decisions about which ones I can accelerate through the cloud. Uh, and that data story is really fascinating right now because unlike 
three years ago, we actually can work with ISVs to analyze our existing pipeline to make some recommendations around how deals can move through this motion more quickly. So they could build a revenue plan earlier on. It's a, it's a different strategic approach. Um, I think the other thing we see, people are launching and are new to this. They're coming with buyers in hand. They have buyers who have been asking to buy this way. So like in the early days of marketplace, you'd launch and then it sometimes would take three to six months until you got aligned in a sales motion to execute on a transaction where we see sellers launching today and executing on deals and dates where they're like, we already have a buyer who wants to do it. We need to get we need to get there so we can execute in this way. And that just helps them accelerate this curve faster. So it's it's a little nuanced and complicated, but I do think that general like start small, keep it simple, figure out what success looks like, replicate success with a pattern that makes sense to your company and then drive to scale. And it's going to be a continuum that takes time. I was really impressed like how big companies like for example, CrowdStrike is going into sort of all in into into marketplaces, right? Because I think like what they seen is that there's a powerful switch that companies, their clients tend to make as soon as they buy through marketplace, they they see the convenience and it's very easy. They they also reduce their cloud commits. They 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 use them to to to, to buy products. So it's like, I think. A lot of people underestimate this as a small detail, which is not really small. It's it's like as soon as buyers start like using it, uh, they, they they there's almost like no going back from, from, from the standpoint. But let's talk about cost sell. Cost sell is is like a, a new motion which is not new. It's uh, it's been forever. Um, and you just mentioned like a couple of really important steps of cost sell. I, I would love to hear um, more in terms of like yes, people underestimate cost sell, but but like where where does they start? Right, it's like typical answer that for example AWS give is that you need to come up with a like, great better to guess story, which which sounds amazing, a little bit confusing. What do you mean? <laughs> What's been your advice in terms of like, how, how do you think through the cost sell? I think your brand with the clouds as a company is the spot you need to start. And this is, this is a bit of the better together story. But if you think about it, the clouds have hundreds of native services. They have thousands of products listed in the marketplace. How are you going to differentiate yourself? You need to differentiate yourself by focusing on what matters to them, helping their buyers, driving core service consumption, and having a really easy story as to how that fits together. And I think like CoSell, you need to go build success stories that are really driven by you as an ISV and then use CoSell to replicate and scale your success stories. If you start trying to CoSell before you've ever driven some success, it will be really hard to differentiate yourself amongst the community of people we're trying to engage with the cloud sellers in order to help buyers. So I, and I, I think like this gets into those same phases of growth. And when you do your first handful of transactions and you're thinking about the long game, you're really trying to understand what the story, what's the story. And you want to be able to tell a story to your customer, like, Hey, here, Mr. Customer, here's why buying our product on AWS or Azure GCP marketplace is good for you. Like that's an important story, but secondarily, and probably even more important to get the scale, the story for the cloud is really important. And actually having the voice of your customer be driving the story for the cloud. Like I, I use my, pro I use this product in combination with these core cloud services. I purchased it through marketplace and all this helped me get to this outcome really fast. That's what the cloud sellers really care about the store. And being able to have real revenue and real customer stories to lean into CoSell with makes it so much easier for the cloud sellers to understand, okay, I understand how this fits in. I think there's also a hack around CoSell we see really smart ISVs do, where they have a team of people who are dedicated to harvesting those CoSell opportunities, where they go drive success with a, you know, it's, and it's a territory alignment problem. Like every ISV has their own definition of ideal customer profile and how they do territories and how they build sales orgs. The clouds all have their own definition. They never match. Like they're always like totally spider webbed all over the place. So how do you, like, how do you build the interface between them? Like that's what these cloud go-to-market specialists do. Like we have a team that does this. And when we go win with 
a seller at AWS, our cloud go-to-market team goes to that seller and it's like, hey, like we just drove success together. Like, do you have other customers that meet this pattern too? Or could we talk to your team, your peers about this and the success we had together? Like that magic of CoSell, like one great deal that's a great story turns into 10 opportunities for you in CoSell. Like that's a magic part of CoSell, but you have to, and CrowdStrike's an amazing example. They've been at this for six or seven years. <laughs> like their success with cloud go to market is not overnight. They have invested heavily for a long period of time to get to the point where they have this amazing brand in the cloud ecosystem. And it's really well understood. Like the Twitter link description of why CrowdStrike plus cloud is pretty well understood inside the ecosystem. So CoSell, like at that scale, it takes, they're a great example of it, it takes strategy and time. Yeah, I, I spoke with CrowdStrike and they, 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 they told the story about, which is to your point, right? Like very simple story. They had a client and this client was supposed to close maybe in half a year, maybe more. Uh, and then they sort of discovered that they have presence in one of the mar marketplaces uh, and uh, they bought in marketplace and they not only bought really rapidly so it took one of them sort of days and then they they were operational also in days right so it's like win-win for everyone including like cloud provider and like the company and so on but like i'm curious uh why do you think people sort of don't understand this causal motion well where, where is it like sort of the, the gap in perception there's this concept called conway's law where effectively like the simple version of conway's law is you ship your org chart and if you think about the clouds and the way they organize, they actually had most of them had CoSell and Marketplace as two separate entities. They've all started to change this over time, but they behaved in different ways. Now that they're coming together, they're starting to behave in a more common way where it's like whether it's peanut butter and jelly, like CoSell and Marketplace go together, whether it's two sides of the same coin. It, it's changed, which is a good thing. And I think in the past, people thought they CoSell, thought they understood CoSell, but it was only from the definition of CoSell and not from this broader cloud go-to-market journey. And I think there's another dynamic we see where people are like, people are concerned about the clouds as competitors. Like uh, a lot of core services compete with ISVs and maybe it's not full out one-to-one -one competition, but there's some overlap really smart ISVs lean into that. And they're like, hey, people are going to start with the cloud service. And eventually they may want an enterprise grade product that's very focused on a specific thing, or they need something that works across clouds or across public and private. And it leads them, like there's a multi-cloud equivalent of every at scale core cloud service. Like Snowflake's a great example of this. And I, I think you, you kind of have to lean into that competition in some ways and be confident in your value prop. Like, hey, here's how you, why you'd use the core service. Here's why you'd use us. Here's when people think about changing and actually make that part of your differentiation. It's okay to start, start in the way that's easy for you and grow up with the solution that matters. So I, I think like there's a fear around CoSell, especially in those places where there's perception of competitive dynamics. Definitely. And uh, I've seen it myself. It, 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 it just doesn't feel like too comfortable, right? And you need to get used to this uh, sense of uh, um, sort of competition. I spoke with uh, recently with Poly AI COO. They just listed on on AWS and AWS has like competitive products, but, 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 but because they have differentiation, so it, it, it doesn't like pose as a threat for for news of them. I wanted to, to to ask you about this better together story. It's like so you mentioned Viz, you you, you mentioned uh, CrowdStrike, uh, sort of both like in cybersecurity. What are the other sort of companies that you think are kind of interesting examples for uh, executing well on this uh, packaging their products and communicating them in a way that makes a lot of sense, drives sort of engagement. Uh, in in the right way. I mean, there's a lot of examples these days. A, a handful that like Auth Zero was one uh, that they were a pretty early tackle customer, and there was a competitive service on AWS to what they did, and there was concern around that, and they were able to launch. And this is actually there's a, a public case study that tells the story. They're, they were able to launch, and in their first year, they only did one deal, and that one deal proved the pattern, and then they saw 10x growth the next multiple years after that. 
where they're like, okay, we proved this works. We understand how it fits in. Now we're going to go replicate that and replicate that at scale over time. Uh, and they just got really clear in how and why they fit together. They had to teach their sellers that. They had to teach the cloud sellers that. And it was a really good success story. I do think Snowflake's an amazing story here. And they continue to, like in the early days, there was a lot of competition between native cloud service and Snowflake. And you, you hear stories of how that all worked. But over time, like, yeah, I mean, was there probably a bunch of noise around that? But they stayed focused on their customers and delivering value and massaging the story where it made sense on both sides. And, you know, they've seen significant growth since then. Um, I Some, like maybe outside of uh, like Seek's a company that I think is really interesting. Their IoT shop for manufacturing business application, like totally outside the box of what you think about like first gen cloud services. And they were able to, like their economic buyer did not understand AWS marketplace, did not understand cloud commitments, but they were able to, again, massage the story. It was, they were built on the cloud and they were able to massage the story to make it easier for people to land and grow with them via this vehicle, which I, I think they were they were one of the early like business application kind of vertical solutions we saw take off with this new way. And it, it does just come back to like focus on your strategy. You know, you have to have a clear product strategy. You have to go build stories of success that are good for your buyers for your sellers, for the cloud providers, and execute. Like it, it really, it's it's not rocket science. It just takes commitment. Amazing. Thanks so much. Uh, I feel like we need to do like a round two on Cosal specifically. Uh, so you have so many great stories and a bunch of hacks, not to mention just huge experience in, in, in the space. Uh, so, but just conscious of time, I would love to ask you about AI, right? There's no conversation without AI. And I think AI brought a lot of excitement back into tech and in, into the clouds and uh, in, in general. So I think it's, it's, it's been great to, to watch a lot of noise as well uh, and a lot of hype, uh, but, but, but I'm sort of curious, like how do you think AI will change or accelerate, or have sort of no impact on on cloud uh, marketplaces and, and partnerships. Is that it's a great question, and I think like we're we're in the very early days, and I'm really curious. Like we see a lot of AI companies racing to embrace cloud go to market early in their life cycle. So I'm curious to see how how fast some of them grow and how successful they are. And so that I mean that's that's one part, and then. When we think about AI, like kind of abstract away from marketplace and cloud go to market and just think about selling, like what are the macro level movements happening in selling right now? You have product led growth, you have usage based pricing, you have, you know, kind of multi channel e commerce distribution, which is where I put cloud go to market. You still have enterprise selling, like the, the, a lot of selling still happens the old fashioned way. Like you have all these things and companies are trying to braid them all together into what's a efficient, scalable growth system that makes sense for me. The spot I think there's a huge opportunity for AI is in the evolution of like product-led growth. How do you help people in a more seamless way engage with your product to get the value fast? Like being able to, even if you have, like we were having this conversation with someone yesterday, be able to take your knowledge base and package up your knowledge base using AI to make it really easy to demystify how people get started. Like those workflows are really hard in the past. I, I think, and I do think the the split between every everybody's business has some sort of bottoms up and some sort of enterprise. And the split between them, it's kind of like probably 90, 10, 80, 20. It varies by the kind of company. But I, I do think we'll see those balance out where as enterprises get more comfortable buying in a more product-led land and expand style way, you'll see the balance between kind of PLG style motion and enterprise maybe neutralize or normalize. Um, and that's the spot I think, like I'm excited to see it plays out there. And what that means trickle down, I think like marketplace is almost a trickle down of that where um, you, know, you as a company have a revenue strategy and that revenue strategy is gonna be made up of a combination of those tools we talked about and then how AI influences that, it's almost like a different substrate. 
I agree with your point about enterprise, and I see that through data, right? So more enterprise companies start to be more comfortable buying through marketplaces, e-commerce sort of motion, putting like big contracts, like huge contracts, right? So like I think like AWS is talking a lot about that, that they had like a first contract which was like a million dollar, and they thought that was a mistake, um, <laughs> but it, it wasn't. So, but but. To wrap this up, uh, I would love to ask you about the future of uh, cloud um, marketplaces. Like if you were to get together in, in a year from now, or maybe like two years from now, what do you think we're gonna be talking about? Uh, given that marketplaces are growing 84%, right? Year over year, which should be, should be just, just, just crazy growth. Like sort of AI is growing in, in, this, in the same sort of like the, the dimension. What do you think, how they will evolve Call marketplaces in in a year, I'll say. One way I think about it is um, like five years from now, every seller in every software company will know how to win with cloud. Like, and today we're probably still in that like five to ten percent. And some companies that are very cloud forward will have a much higher percentage. But if you looked at it at a, a more like broad population standpoint, there's a lot of adoption to happen at a seller level for these new emotions. So I, I do think five years from now, every rep will know how to win with cloud. I think on the flip side, every buyer will understand how to buy. And I think that buying pattern and behavior is not just like the private offer style buying pattern now, it will be discover in marketplace. And we're starting to see that shift. And you said it earlier where you're like, once people buy this way, they don't wanna go back. <laughs> like no one wants to, go back to, hey, let's spend six months in procurement. Like that's a whole lot of fun for no one. Um, so if if the change in the buyer behavior is happening and people see that this works and they get more comfortable with it, it's only no, naturally going to lead to more. So, interesting. so I do think five years from now, everyone will know how to buy through cloud as well as be more comfortable buying in both the bottoms up and tops down way. Um, I do like, I think there's a question, like it's a very, I get this question all the time about how many marketplaces will matter in the future. Jay talks about this all the time and I think his number's in the twenties. I I still like, when you go back to that incentive problem, this is a hard problem to solve. It's an expensive problem to solve. Like the clouds have the budget, the long-term focus uh, it, and like budget has gravity. And if you don't have that gravity of budget that you're solving with, it's really hard to create a new marketplace. So I do think there will be more than three. There are more than three today, but even when you look at the cloud market share and cloud market share growth, there were some interesting projections around that over the last five years or the next five years. It's, it's unclear like who the next real challenger from a marketplace standpoint will be. So I'm curious to see that, that play out. I think the channel, like, Channel transformation is underway. Smart channel companies are acknowledging that their businesses are changing and marketplace is part of that change. Leaders are leaning into that, but there's others who are still kind of stuck in the old world. And uh, I think like there's a lot over the next five years that's gonna happen with channel. As we think about like $755 billion of B2B software, how does that migrate to the cloud? The channel is a big part of that answer. Like it's, I actually think we could see growth rates accelerate as channels come online to embracing this style. So that that's a thing that I think about. Yes, yeah, like channel channel partners plus marketplace. And then the last thing I still think discovery is uh like the way again meta level the way software is discovered. People go to Google, they search a problem, they find an ad, or they find some content, they watch a podcast, and they're like, oh, this is interesting. I should go check that out. Like. The evolution of discovery over the next five years, I think will be really, I'm really interested to see how that works. People tend to like discover through reviews, they, they, they check reviews and they just kind of like make decision, then talk with, with, with other people in their community and so on. Look, uh, that, that, that's been like amazing ep episodes. I really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you so much. I learned a lot and uh, I would encourage everyone to check out Tackle.io and uh, if you uh, work with cloud marketplaces or you double into, in, into that, definitely uh, feel the, the state of cloud go to markets, uh, that the survey you've been running, right? Uh, and that the results are going to be in October. I'm looking forward to. Yeah.
Hundred percent right. Survey's still open, so we would love people to participate. And results come out in October. It's one of my favorite times of the year. Forward to to have another discussion, digging deeper into call cell maybe at some point. Uh, thanks so much, John. Thanks, Roman.